I have to say, we're in Judges chapter 6 again this morning. I talked to Brent a little bit about this earlier. Um, I've been ecstatic because I know we, we were in Judges originally, but we ended up there, and I just can't get out of this chapter. <laughs> we're, we're still going to be there next time I come back. I'll, I'll forewarn you of that. I just keep pulling more out of this Judges chapter 6, which, which excites me, because that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you can go through a chapter and like, eh, you know, it's just different things jump out to you at different times. I am loving chapter 6 right now. So that's where we're at again today, verses 25 to 32 in Judges chapter 6, if you have your Bibles this morning. Starting in verse 25, and this is the NIV version. That same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside him. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of its height. Using the wood of the, Asher of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and of the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished. And the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told Gideon, the son of Joash, did it. The people of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son, he must die. Because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, Are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jeroboam that, that day, saying, Let Baal contend with him. Let us pray this morning. Father, I praise you this morning, Lord, that that, yes, we're in the Old Testament, Lord, and it, we can glean so much from it. Father, I praise you for that. This, just being in this chapter for these weeks, Lord, I thank you for what you have shown us out of there. Shown us in regards to where we're going as a church, where we need to go. How we need to get ourselves right, Lord, to get on that path. I praise you for it this morning, Lord. I thank you for the excitement for the spirit-filled people that I see here, that I see in this community, Lord. Praise you for that. Be with us today, Lord. Show us what you have in your way. Help me to speak clearly and boldly and truthfully this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, now last week we said Gideon laid the groundwork. Or sorry, God laid the groundwork for what he wanted Gideon to do. Much like he's laying the groundwork for what he wants us to do. What he wants our church to do. We are indeed, I believe, at a tipping point. I got, we, so which means we have to say to ourselves something which God already knows. We, we Can we move forward boldly? Sorry, we can move forward boldly. While holding fast to the very inerrant truths that are in this book, the Word of God, regardless of what might come our way. We can do this even in a seemingly hostile environment. We can do it. We've seen Christians all over the world do it. But that means a couple things. We can do this moving forward. In doing this, we, can, we have to rely heavily on the leading of the Holy Spirit. Heavily on the protection of the legions of heaven which will surround the servants of the Most High God. And it also will require an unwavering support of our fellow Christian brothers and sisters that are seated here beside us this morning. Or, the other option, we can remain comfortable. We can, we can set a, a status quo type goal for ourselves and for our church that, that relies little on the leading of the Spirit, little on God's protection, and heavily on our own efforts and our own abilities. Abilities that without God would take us no, what, really any farther than we are right now in our trying to advance the kingdom of God. We can only go so far on our own. We cannot survive long doing it on our own. In this world, we have seen what happens to churches that, that try to go it on their own. Gideon's people are figuring out. They tried to do it by themselves for a while. It didn't work. It's been miserable for seven years, as we read. That's why now they're seeking 
God's help. That's why we are seeking God's help. That is why Gideon and many others of this day are reaching out to him once again. They need his leading. They know it. They need his help. They need his deliverance. Because they tried it on their own. We saw what happened. It was not good. But God had a plan, didn't he? He has a plan for us too this morning. Long before we reached out to him, he was laying that groundwork. And we see it in the scriptures. And we see it in our lives. We're going to see it in our lives here as well. Now, I know we're supposed to be in the Red Letter series. That kind of took us on a, on a rabbit trail, as Graham McCaught. We got a little, a little off course. But then I got to thinking about something. Think about this. This opportunity to look at, at how God the Father throughout time has provided a way who has set the groundwork, not just in Gideon's case, case after case after case throughout the Bible, has laid the groundwork for his people. He always provides a way for his people, for his children. When they call on him, he does answer. He always does. Even when they seemingly don't deserve it. You know, sometimes you read through it and you think, well, <laughs> they're doomed now. Nope. He will deliver. We serve that same God here this morning. The one and only God, and, and he is just as good and righteous today and holy today as he was in the Old Testament, as he is in the New Testament. It's the same God today. Can somebody please say amen to that? Amen. Ooh, oh. <laughs> we believe and we follow the same God. The angel of the Lord we're reading about that keeps talking to Gideon. That keeps leading him. Who do you think that is? It's the same God. One God, three forms, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's always been that way. It's not a new concept. It might be to some of us, but it's not to him. So you can say these discussions between the Lord and Gideon, they fit right into where we've been all along. So with that, let's continue with our study in the book of Judges. As I said, chapter 6. I titled this part of the message, First Things First. First Things First. And that's what the Lord is saying to Gideon in the beginning of these scriptures this morning. He's saying, alright, we've got some things we've got to take care of first. Let's look at verse 14. It's actually a little ahead of everything. Think about what he told Gideon in verse 14. Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? He told him he was sending to do the Lord's work and also reassured Gideon that indeed the Lord God would be with him. He even confirmed that it was him telling him so by consuming the offering in fire. Pretty dramatic, but unmistakable. In that day, they knew God's the only one that's going to do that. And that solidified it for Gideon. Now let's take a look at what's next. What's the Lord's next step with Gideon? Kind of, I think it's our next step too. Verse 25 and 26. That same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar in the pail, and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of its height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt off. He gave him some directions. I think by he told him he's going to deliver, deliver his girl by his hand. And then he gave him some directions. He didn't say, all right, go get your soldiers. All right, get all this, all, all these men ready. We're going to war. He didn't say, start building up a pile of weapons. We're going to need weapons. You're going to need armor. You're going to need all this stuff before we go to war. No, there's something more important he had to take care of first. He needed to know that Gideon was all in. That there's nothing else standing in the way. That he's willing to follow the Lord God and only him. He was saying to Gideon, if you're going to win this battle for me, by me delivering the enemy to you, you got to serve me and me only. I don't share. He told Gideon to rip down his father's altar to Baal. Cut down the sheriff beside him. And it, this wasn't just the town altar. It's his dad's. It's at his dad's house. Here's the weakest guy of the weakest tribe. Note here, to, and I want you to make a note here if you have your Bibles open or you know, on that sheet they give you in the bulletin. Write down a note that, that, what God, that God's doing something amazing through this seemingly weak individual. Even a self-proclaimed weakest individual because it's important and we're going to see why soon. That God picks this, this weak guy. Just what's capable of that? Because sometimes we think we're weak. Sometimes we think, oh, I can't do this. I can't do it. But we're, going to, we're going to get to that. So God is telling Gideon, as he's telling us, I 
must be above everything else. Everything else. No excuses. You are my people, not Baal's. Because it doesn't exist anyways. I want nothing standing in the way. Nothing between me and my children. A lot of you would say that for your kids. We let nothing between us and our children. God wants the same thing. Nothing between you and him. Nothing standing in the way. He says, I will deliver them as no one else can. And they will know that it was done by the hand of the Lord. So the question for us is this. What are our bales? What are, they? what are our idols that, that the Lord wants us to get out of the way? What do we need to get rid of? What's keeping you from focusing completely on the Lord? What's taking your attention off of Him? Even in these, these 40 days of prayer that we're been, think about it, because I, every one of you here, I'm sure, can tell me it's easy to get distracted. Even when you say, oh, I'm going to take five minutes, I'm going to pray specifically. It happens pretty quick. Or you can forget pretty quick. What do we need to tear down, to throw away, or just plain walk away from? What is it? I don't mean, I don't mean to tear down little, little wooden idols. Unless you have them, please discard them. <laughs> but what do we need to get rid of? What needs to go? Do you remember the very first of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20? The very first one. And God spoke these words saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Baal was an idol. That's all he was, a false god, a figment of their imagination. An excuse to say whatever they wanted, an excuse to do whatever they wanted, an excuse to act in whatever way they felt like on a particular day. Well, Baal says it's okay. Well, yeah, we have them too. It might not be a wooden statue, it may not be a pole outside, but we've all had them, some of us still do. We all have something. We have things that keep us from focusing on and following the Lord. The world has their false religions. And they chase them, looking for fulfillment, fulfillment that's superficial and fake, just like the idols that they're worshiping. And then you have the trickier ones. The not as obvious ones. The ones that are even more dangerous. They're not as obvious as the statues and the writings that some pile. No, they're harder to identify. And harder and harder to free ourselves from because they're hidden in plain sight right in front of our faces. Right before our eyes. It's just simple. Yet, well, well, what is this? What, what, it could be, what is it for me? Well, it could be something different for everybody. It could be as simple as your desires. Desires for a perfect spouse, a perfect family, a perfect career, the biggest salary you can get, the highest title you can earn or wherever. They block our vision. They plug our ears. And like the statues torn down by Gideon, they stand between us and God. Think about it. And, and it's not just in the world. It could be in the church. You could have an idol right here. It could be something that's getting in the way of you and true worship, you and the Spirit. It could be a title. It could be a position in the church. I've just always wanted that. i got to have it. i got to have it. i got to be that person. Why? We talked about something this morning. There's things we do because we've always done it, and so people can't tell you why. If all they can tell you is what we always did, we need to think about why we do it. There's just little things that can get in the way. God says get rid of them. If it's distracting you from a holy life, from following God's word, then it's in the way. If we want God to use us, to use the church, we need to make sure that he's our only focus. There's nothing else in the way. There's nothing else we're striving for. That's, it's okay to strive for things. That's not a problem. It's, it's when you're striving for that above striving for a relationship with God, striving for His leading. He'll provide what you need if He's first. The God of our fathers is the only one that has control of our lives. Like I said, He's jealous God. He doesn't share. He wants your whole focus, your whole heart. Let go of whatever it is that's holding you back, that's keeping you from hearing the voice of the Spirit in your life. Let it go. 
No, I wrote this down last minute. This little part here. Maybe there's something that has a hold of somebody here. One of you here. I don't know. This is keeping you from hearing God, from feeling His presence. Maybe you know what it is. Maybe you don't. But I'm telling you right now, in the presence of the Almighty God Himself, it has no power in this room. It has no power in your life. It may have fooled you. It may have kept you held down, but it has no authority. It has no power. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, He defeated evil, and the devil knows it. He knows it very well. So I tell you this morning, let it go. Say to the Lord, I'm yours, God. Save me and free me from this evil that has bound me for too long. I, if you have done this this morning, if you do it tonight, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are free. It doesn't hold anything over you. It fools you into thinking that. Nothing but Jesus Christ in this world has that power. Remember that this morning. Jesus Christ took this weak man in Gideon and told him, at first, you've got to get rid of that statue. You've got to get rid of all this stuff. I don't share. It doesn't work that way. It's got to go. And he does it. Gideon does it. That's another cool part. Because the uh, Slide the way, he does it. Look at verse 27. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. So he's a little scared. So he does it at night. But he does it. It's not like he didn't do it. He gets rid of that statue and replaces it with an altar to the one true God. Of course, had it been done in the daytime, when you, when you keep bringing it, they'd have killed him if they caught him doing it in the daytime. Mm -hmm. But he did it. That's we're going to see. They're pretty mad. Verses 28 to 30. In the morning, when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished, gone. With the Asherah pole beside it, cut down, and the second bowl sacrificed on the newly built altar. They just rip it down. They use it to build the new altar. They give that sacrifice on it. They ask, who did this? They asked each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. The people of the town demanded to Joash, bring out your son. He must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. He did what he was told. He got rid of it. He said, we're not having that here anymore. It's got to go. And they came out furious. Someone, brings up Gideon, had did it. He tore down their altar. Now think about this. This was Gideon's family. This was Gideon's tribe, this community. That'd be like the town of East Smithfield circling around your door in the morning and saying, get out of here. You're done. No. But he didn't. So all of a sudden you can see what it made more, just more sense to him to do it at night because he really didn't want to face that. Right or wrong, fear led him to that decision. Fear of death. Fear of what was going to happen. Fear has been involved in the choices that, have made, that, have, that many of us have made. Sometimes, even fear is part of our decision when we decide to be saved by the blood of Christ. Now, that sounds like a contradictory thing, doesn't it? Fear is keeping some of you from publicly calling Him your Savior right now. It's not fear that it works. It's not fear that maybe you're not saved. But it's a fear of what somebody else might think. Or what somebody else might say. Or what somebody else might do. And some of you might have it. We don't know what your family situation is. Some of you might have a legitimate Fear. It's not to say that fear is not real, that fear is not legitimate sometimes. Think about it. Just like Gideon, deep down inside, we're all privately saying, some of us are saying, Jesus, Jesus come into my heart. No, Jesus, be my Lord. I repent of my sins. And that's it. It's not that we don't mean it, but the rest of the world doesn't know. We know it, but we're keeping it inside because we're fearful of what somebody might say. We're scared of what they might do, what they might think of us. Well, I want to tell you first, one thing, that if that's the kind of friends you're hanging with, if that's the kind of fam the way your family treats you, you need a new group. You need to surround yourself with those who will rejoice at the decision you've made and welcome you in. Gideon took this first step, and quietly. Came public pretty quick. 
If the Lord is working in your heart, I'm telling you right now, you're not going to hide it for very long. You can at first. But if He's working, you're not going to be able to hide it. And in the morning, what Gideon had done was seen. The decision he had made was seen. And it took that courage. It took him doing that. And somebody realizing what he'd done to join him. To stand up. What does his father do? He emboldened his father. Verse 31, Gideon's dad addressed the angry crowd. They're at his door. He's standing there saying, bring your kid out here. You all know you don't like your kid to get insulted. You don't like somebody threatening you. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, Are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you going to try to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal is a god, if really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. His dad stepped up and took this faithful act. When he saw what his son did, that emboldened him. I love his response. I love it. And I, and I think it's one we don't use enough today in our politically correct world, in our politically correct church even, around this world, that nobody wants to be offended. He says, are you going to fight for Baal? Really? Is that what this is? Are you going to do that? Somebody tore down his little altar. If he's a god, he can take care of it himself. happened, didn't it? Because it's just a piece of wood. It wasn't real. But no, we can't do that anymore. We, can't, we have to play nice. We, we can't say that. We have to say it's okay. We'll just live together in harmony and it'll sort it out at the end. Eh, wrong answer. It will get sorted out at the end. I have no doubt about that. Much to the dismay of many, it will get sorted out. I have no doubt. But why are we afraid? Why don't we say okay? Why don't we say that? Why don't we say okay? Let your God fight for himself. Let your idol fight for himself. If he or she is real, then show us. Sit there and pray to your God and let him work. There's a prophet that did that in the Old Testament. We saw how that worked. Why are we afraid to do that? We're all guilty of it at times. Of the very same thing. Thinking that we can fight God's battle for him, or that, or that we know better, that we're smarter for some reason. We get this in our head that we'll just pull ahead and do it by ourselves. And we see what happens when that takes place. As I said in the last couple of weeks, God doesn't need us. He doesn't have to have us, but He uses us. He does. He leads us. He has laid the groundwork. He knows what's going to take place. He knows what the end result is. He knows what He's trying to accomplish. Sometimes we throw our own wrench in there. Like, well, what if we did it this way? No, 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 no. But we, but we do. Trust that if we live as Jesus commanded us, if we live in love, if we show his love, if we honor one another, if we show kindness to one another, if we live as he intended and as he showed us, God will take care. He will take care of us. He will take care of his church. He will see that end result that he wants to see that he's laid that groundwork for. He just wants us to obey because it's already there. The plan's already there. It's the same for Gideon. The plan's already there. Just tell him, get that stuff out of the way because we're going to work. We, just don't, we don't need any distractions. Think about that. If you're going into battle, if you're in the service, when you're going into battle, they, want, they don't want anything in here getting in your way. Anything that's going to make you hesitate. Anything that's going to stop you from achieving your goal doesn't need to be in there. You need to be focused. God says, be focused on me. Be focused on my leading, and I'll, I'll take care of the rest. Now, as I said, I got excited when I got into Judges, but I, I couldn't put it all in I've got a clipboard of notes that I can't, that I couldn't put in here this morning. But I want to leave you with a scripture meant for next time because I want you to think about it. I said to Mark down in your Bibles that, that Jesus, that, sorry, that God used this weak individual. That he was going to do great things to this little weak guy. I told you it's very important. I'm going to read you a scripture and I want you to ruminate on it until next time. And think about what 
was accomplished by God choosing to embolden this, this, this weakest of men, as he calls himself. Why, well, as we saw, a little bit of it with his father. Just a little piece of it, and it gets bigger. It grows. When, when, when a small group or a weak individual takes a stand, when they're bold for their faith, when they're obedient, it multiplies. That's just the very first part. And we're going to see more of that as we study out. Look at these scriptures. Also, write down the word unity. Sorry, I almost missed that. People are unified when this takes place. Verses 33 to 35. Now all the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the other eastern people joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Remember, that's, that's this horde of people, this plague of people, and more camels than you can count, as it said in the scriptures. That's that people, they're coming. It's that time of year. Crops are ready. We're going to come demolish everything you've worked for. They're coming. They've crossed the river. They've set up camps. And the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abyssalites to follow him. He sent messengers through, throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, also to Asher, to Zebulun, to Naphtali, to all these other cities, to all these other territories, so that they went up to meet him as well. He's calling in the cowboy. Think about it. Read it this week. Read on. I encourage you to read on. And see what happens. See how the effect is multiplied. From one little guy, and God says, I'm going to deliver Israel through your hands. A guy that was scared. But the Lord has encouraged him. The Lord has given him signs to say, it's me. It's okay. Keep going. We're going to see that he's still going to keep encouraging him. It's a process. And just look and see what is done. And we'll get into that next week. Let us pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning, Lord, that, that the accounts of your faithful servants, Lord, are recorded. Lord, that we may learn. That we may see, Lord, how you work. How you always have work. Father, how you're always there. We deliver your faithful servants, Lord. We deliver your children. And Father, we know you don't share. Father, forgive us for, for sticking things in the way. <laughs> Be with us this morning, Father, as we remember the sacrifice of your son that took place that we may be delivered to. That we may be standing right here this morning. As we get ready for that this morning, Lord, I praise you and I thank you. Amen.